All right, hey folks, um, let's go over unit nine in our study guide. Uh, let's see if I can get this pulled up, there we go. All right, so unit nine, this is the, the big one, the one you have to, and I stress this, really have to master, okay? And it's something I think that we can, um, but since nobody's here, uh, hopefully this video helps and you've been working a little bit on your own. All right, um, as we get this pulled up, I'd say uh, don't forget to do your AP classroom work. All right, that'll help a little bit. Come on, buddy. Just find my time, la, la, la. Um, there we go. Okay, let's go through this. I'm going to go through this fast, so try and stay with me here, okay? So we'll go with number one. Get this little, you going to work with me? Come on, buddy. All right, there we go. All right, how does the stratospheric ozone layer contribute to the evolution of life and continuation of life on the earth. That's literally what the standard says. So in terms of stratospheric ozone, we know that that protects us from UV radiation. All right. So how does it contribute to evolution of life? Well, as long as that's there, life can evolve and continue with no issues. However, um, if there's some kind of problem with the stratospheric ozone, like if it tends to recede or, um, you know, minimize, like we've had the issue with the hole in the ozone layer, then life is going to suffer because more ultraviolet light is entering the earth. And um, that can damage plants, it can damage algae, it can uh, cause cancer uh, in animals as well. So um, it causes severe issues here. Um, too. So a lot of life on Earth has evolved because of the ozone layer protects us, but also things that get, do get through. We also evolve for like the melanin in my skin right here. A lot of that comes from my um, Indian ancestry. And um, since we're close to the equator there, we have a more developed sense of, a more developed melanin in our in our skin to help absorb some of that UV radiation. Now, next question is, what is depleting this ozone layer? Well, there's a lot of natural things, surprisingly enough, that deplete the ozone layer. However, chlorofluorocarbons specifically, all right, that we're producing from, if you're looking at this, from uh, refrigerators and aerosols. Those are the two things. You have to make sure you know both of those. Refrigerants, the CFCs are refrigerants, and aerosols. That's inside those aerosolized cans, okay? Um, both of those um, release CFCs, which stands for chlorofluorocarbon, all right? And that's going to contribute to the depletion because of this. If you take a look at our um, big image right here, it's the chlorofluorocarbon, so chlorine and fluorine carbon. The chlorine breaks off and karate chops the oxygen. When it karate chops the oxygen, you see it splits off one of the um, oxygens here from ozone, which is O3 leaving with O2, which is normal oxygen, but normal oxygen doesn't protect us from ultraviolet radiation. Normally, the ozone does. So when it blocks it, blocks it off and then attaches it to other free oxygen floating around in there, and that's um, what the breakdown of ozone is, going from O3 to two units of O2 there. Now, if we come back up here and take a look, refrigerants and aerosols to put in the ozone layer, um, there are a couple other situations we need to talk about. So. Number three, what effects are there from UV radiation? We are talking about skin cancer. That's what melanin is for, to protect you from skin cancer. The melanin absorbs the UV radiation. Crop destruction, producers, your plants, they'll get destroyed by this. Same reason I get a sunburn, right, is the same reason the crops will die, because the UV radiation can actually break your DNA apart. And when it does, your DNA doesn't work, your cells can't operate. The same goes for plants. Their cells can't operate. Marine life is killed. Again, breaking down the producers there. All the, um, uh, the bacteria, the algae, I should say cyanobacteria and algae. Okay, the producers of that area. Next, this is something we haven't talked about in class, but in looking through things online, this is something that I thought you should know about, so hopefully you're watching this video uh, and noting this. Please note this. How does ice building in the atmosphere in the Antarctic winter play a role in accelerating this process? So the ice in the Antarctic um, can actually contribute to the hole in the ozone layer too. There are natural issues as well. And it's because of this. It's because of the Antarctic spring. Believe it or not, when the ice builds up in the atmosphere, because that's what clouds are predominantly, right? Frozen water and dust. Um, but anyways, when the ice in the atmosphere above the Antarctic starts to melt, okay, that uh, melting snow, the ice up there, when it starts to melt, will actually karate chop the oxygen too, and it'll take the oxygen away from ozone, okay? So if I can, the ice builds up in the winter, and then as it melts in the spring, 
all right, the ice that's melting, all right, the, uh, the actual melted ice, the water up there will start to break apart ozone as well, okay? And that's going to contribute to a destruction of the ozone layer. So weirdly enough, it's CFCs, yes, but also naturally, it happens in the changing weather up there when the frozen ice starts to melt during the spring. The spring is when the ozone layer recedes a bit, just naturally, okay? Next, what solutions do we have to the uh, issue of stratospheric ozone depletion? Well, um, we use HFCs, which are hydrofluorocarbons, okay? So HFCs are great because they do not deplete the ozone layer. There's no chlorine, right? We mentioned the fact that chlorine is karate chopping the ozone, okay? And so we take the chlorine out and replace it with hydrogen. But the problem, of course, here is that HFCs are also strong global warming gases, just like CFCs are. So CFCs and HFCs both contribute to global warming, okay? But these are better because they at least don't contribute to the hole in the ozone layer. That's the complicated part of this, all right? Um, next up here, this is something I haven't really talked about, but I thought it's important to at least address since, again, um, I didn't bring this up during normal class. But believe it or not, people living at high altitudes, they have less air above them. So if you're talking about the Earth's atmosphere, you have the troposphere up here. If you're on a mountain, right, you're going to have less air above you, between you and the sun. Okay, and so some of the UV rays will get you up here, a little bit more targeted here than they are to someone down on the surface. So if UV rays are attacking your eyes, believe it or not, they can actually cause cataracts. All right, and um, when they, uh, they do, a cataract is basically just when your lens, the lens in your eye starts to fog. Have you ever seen old people and their eyes look like white? Okay, in some movies, they're like blind and their eyes look white. It's because of cataracts, basically because they've been looking at the sun so long um, that the UV radiation actually changes their, it fogs their lens. It happens to people who live in like Nepal, okay, places that are high up in the mountains. It happens to them a lot more often um, through age, and they have to get those cataracts removed. Um, and those lenses are removed and replaced with synthetic ones. But um, that does happen to people living in high altitudes. Okay, uh, next up here. How is the ozone layer connected to CO2 and global warming? The answer is the ozone layer is not connected to CO2 and global warming. The ozone layer has pretty much nothing to do with CO2 and global warming, okay? That's not to say that there aren't chemicals that play a role in both. CFCs, we mentioned before, they contribute to global warming a lot and they contribute to the ozone layer, okay? But the ozone layer right? UV radiation is very different from global warming, all right? The UV radiation has very little to do with the earth heating up, okay? All right. Um, next up, what was the Montreal Protocol and was it successful? That's when all the countries came together in like 1987 or 1989 and said, hey, let's all reduce, <coughs> excuse me, the amount of CSCs we have in the atmosphere. And so they did, they got together, they made the promise and uh, things got better. We stopped producing CSCs, we started making HFCs and other chemicals to replace the HFCs. But regardless, was it successful? Absolutely. So please remember, the Montreal Protocol is not about global warming. It's about the ozone layer. Next, CFCs are anthropogenic. Anthropogenic just means humans did it. Okay? Done by humans. Okay? And um, are they found naturally? The answer is no. CFCs are not natural. Straight just from humans. Okay? So that's the ozone layer. All right, please remember the Montreal Protocol and the effects of ozone. That's always a big deal. What are the effects? And of course, where does, uh, not the effects of ozone, the effects of ozone depletion. There we go. All right, we get rid of it, causes UV radiation, which can kill crops. It can cause cancer, it can cause cataracts. Um, those are the things to know, okay? Next, uh, greenhouse effect. What is the greenhouse effect and how does it work? The greenhouse effect is basically when the earth is heating up, okay, at a, at a rapid rate. And it's heating up at a rapid rate because much like a greenhouse, if I can find some way to write, there we go. The atmosphere is kind enough to allow visible light to come all the way down to the earth. Okay, visible light has no issues getting down to the earth. And the earth absorbs all that visual light and turns it into heat. Okay, but heat, as we know, radiates out. Something that's hot is going to release that heat as infrared radiation. And so infrared radiation tries to leave, but it can't, and it gets redirected back down at the Earth, 
okay? And this is caused by greenhouse gases, all right? Greenhouse gases trap that heat and prevent it from going back into space where it belongs. Um, what are the primary greenhouse gases? Well, I got them listed out here for you. Uh, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons. Those are the primary ones you want to know about. The one that we can do the most about right now is CO2. Methane something we can help with. Um, but um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons and nitrous oxides, we both, we produce lots of those ourselves. So we can do something about them as well. What simple factors make something a strong greenhouse gas? Well, simply enough, it's really good at absorbing and redirecting infrared light. Okay, so it's got to be really good. It's got these double bonds, for example, in carbon dioxide, which can absorb that and then redirect that uh, infrared light back down at the earth. But the key here is this, stability, all right? How long it stays in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide doesn't have very long to live in the atmosphere before it's either taken in by plants or other producers. Um, and so it can be pulled out pretty easily out of the atmosphere as long as we're not overproducing it, okay? But there are some chemicals like CFCs, all right? And methane, which stay in the air much, much longer and that causes them to have a, well, I shouldn't say methane. Methane does get out pretty quickly. But CFCs and other chemicals stay in the air for a long time, um, and in some cases, decades, all right? And it's, it's hard for us to get rid of them. That's the main issue here. Uh, and of course, thermal absorption, the ability to, like I said, bring in that infrared energy and then kick it back out, all right? So how long does it stay up there, and how well is it being absorbed? Um, next up, is the greenhouse effect good or bad? Well, the answer is it's kind of both. We don't want too much, okay, because that would be bad. But at the same time, we need a little bit of greenhouse effect because that way it keeps the Earth's temperature um, from going like below freezing at night. We don't want all the heat to leave. We want it to stay uh, somewhat around the Earth during the nighttime, and that's the greenhouse effect helping us um, keep the temperature more constant. Next up, what is GWP? That's global warming potential. And so when we talk about this, what makes something a good global warming gas, right? It's, that's basically it's GWP, okay? It's global warming potential. So if we look at these, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and CFCs. If we're ranking these from greatest to least GWP, the greatest will be those CFCs, right? Then nitrous oxide, then methane, and then carbon dioxide, okay? In that order, okay? In terms of their rank. These ones... CFCs significantly greater than carbon dioxide. I think methane we mentioned before was like 25 or 26 times more potent. Okay, but these guys are in the hundreds uh, more potent than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is like our base unit. Okay, so if you talk about global warming potential of carbon dioxide is one. Okay, of methane it would be 25 or 26. Okay, so global warming potential for carbon dioxide is one. That's our base unit. Now, um, how do greenhouse gases contribute to global warming? Well, like I said, they absorb the energy and they kick it back down to us. Um, water, specifically though, is the major greenhouse gas. The problem with water is, is that, I shouldn't say the problem, but the, the thing about water is that it doesn't stay very long in the atmosphere, okay? And we're not releasing a whole bunch of water, okay? So, um, when people try to bring up the fact that water is a greenhouse gas, they're saying it as though carbon dioxide and methane and CFCs don't matter. They do, okay? The more carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere, the more CFCs we have in the atmosphere, the more actual evaporation we're gonna have because they're trapping more heat. More heat trapped close to the earth because of greenhouse gases means more water will evaporate. More water evaporating means you have more heat being held at the earth, okay? But the nice thing is, of course, you have more rainfall. The more evaporation, the more rainfall, water kind of balances out, okay? Water has a short lifespan in the atmosphere, okay? It rains back down quickly, it doesn't hang around for long. So that's why we're not worried about water, okay? Unless a lot of it is being evaporated, okay? By the amount of heat we're storing on the earth. What we can do something about are these things. CFCs, nitrous oxide, methane, and carbon dioxide, okay? And they can help us, if we reduce them, uh, prevent the greenhouse effect from becoming too strong. So, if you have a strong greenhouse effect, you're going to have a lot of global warming. So let's talk about it. How does global warming affect ice sheets? They're going to melt. Ocean water expansion. You heat up the ocean, it's going to expand. Okay, again, raising those sea levels. Um, disease factors moving from the tropics to the poles. 
Diseases that were once, you know, uh, contiguous to the equator are now going to start to expand as the earth warms. Well, that means that the mosquitoes who will only live in the tropics can now move to more temperate areas like where we are. Okay, when we start having issues with uh, things like West Nile and, and Zika virus, things that are normally centered around Brazil and the equator. Um, let me see. What do most populations do in response to the heat? Um, they will migrate. Right, they'll go to somewhere either cooler, right, that they wanted to be, or uh, I guess they could also that they can die. That's the other option. So migrate or die, essentially there in response to the changing um, and global warming uh, caused by global warming. Um, what do whales do when the ice melts and algae bloom in the poles? Well, when the ice melts, right, you get all this fresh, clean water, and you get lots of runoff with lots of good nutrients in it going into the water. You'll get algal blooms, okay, and you'll get uh, lots of krill. Okay, lots of algae, lots of krill. Whales will migrate to those places to find more food, okay? Uh, but of course, if we melt off all the ice sheets, then there won't be quite as much algal blooming going on, which would be a problem for the whales. What do polar bears do when the ice they live on and get their food from melts away? Well, polar bears will have to migrate south, okay? They'll have to go to find food. Um, they're meat eaters predominantly, so they're gonna have to find meat uh, they're going to have to eat other animals uh, that they're not used to. They normally hunt seals on top of the ice. They'll also go through people's trash cans, which is dangerous to people and populations. Number five, has the Earth's temperature changed over time? Yes, of course it has. We've had ice ages and stuff in the past, as well as areas of uh, lots of warming. Why? Well, we've got to remember that the Earth is going around the sun. Okay, And as the Earth goes around the sun, sometimes it gets a little wider, and then sometimes it comes a little closer. Okay, and that changes a lot about how much um, energy we receive on the Earth and whether or not it's a, a hotter time or a colder time. Um, how do we know this? Well, ice cores. And what are ice cores? Well, if you go to one of the glaciers there in Antarctica, right, and you drill a hole way deep down in it and pull that out, you'll basically have hundreds of thousands of years. Like this could stretch somewhere over um, 300,000 years. I don't know why it's not letting me write. There you go. Oh. Lord. Okay, you can have 300,000 years of data in just this one little ice core. Okay, and uh, inside the ice, we have bubbles. All right, in those bubbles, we can measure the actual um, composition of gases, right? So we can tell how much CO2 there was in the atmosphere, or how much methane there was, or how much oxygen there was. All this things can be measured by ice cores that have trapped bubbles inside them. Um, and that's how we tell how the Earth's temperatures change over time. Next, how do plants and other producers help reduce the greenhouse effect? Well, obviously, if we can, um, if we have plants and producers doing their job, they're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, out of the ocean, and that's going to minimize the amount of greenhouse effect cost. Continuing here, um, let me see, there you go. All right, climate change. The effects of climate change are... Rising temperatures, okay? It's going to heat up on the earth in different places. Melting permafrost and sea ice. So you melt the ice on the land, you melt the frozen soil, you melt the sea ice, okay? Rising sea levels, displacement of coastal populations. So if we're looking at these, all of these are going to have consequences. Temperatures rise, well, you're going to have crazy weather patterns. That's the climate change. Rising temperatures causes chaotic weather. You'll have droughts, you'll have floods all in places that aren't used to droughts or floods, okay? Um, rising temperatures can cause issues with uh, the gender of certain organisms, like turtles, right? Um, melting permafrost. You melt the permafrost in the Arctic, then trees can grow there. If trees grow in the Arctic, then grass doesn't. And the grazers, like the caribou who live there in the tundra and migrate there in the summer, will not have anything to eat, okay? And so you'll have too many trees there for the caribou uh, to be sustained. Um, if the sea ice melts, you're going to have an issue with the polar bears because that's where they get their food from, right? Hunting for the seals down below. Um, rising sea levels are going to displace coastal populations, okay? If you raise the sea levels, cities will then end up underwater, okay? Um, you can also cause an issue with the plants, the plants that live along the continental shelf. If they normally live in the photic zone right here, okay, but then the water level goes higher, Okay, all of a sudden, the plant that was alive right here, this was the photic zone. This now becomes the aphotic zone. That means there's no light, and that can kill the plants there and change the ecosystem uh, itself. 
right? Because then you have no more plants up here. Uh, let me see. How can marine life benefit from climate change? There we go. How can marine ecosystem benefit from climate change? Well, if you're looking at a, a marine ecosystem, um, when you do have climate change going on, you, you might have warmer waters, right, spread throughout. Warmer waters spread throughout can mean um, you could have more animals and organisms that can live there uh, in new places. So tropics um, start to expand, so the organisms in the tropics can have more. Um, you know, melting sea ice can cause al algal blooms, so at first there could be algal blooms. However, the main issue is how can marine ecosystems suffer from climate change? So when we talk about this, this idea of global warming, we already talked about photic zone, but global warming specifically, if you increase the temperature, all right, of the oceans, you will decrease solubility, okay? Gases decrease solubility when the temperature gets too high. So that means oxygen levels will go down, okay? Fish can only handle so much stress, okay? And so if it gets too hot and there's not enough oxygen in the water, the fish are going to die. And that's going to be an issue for anything trying to live off the ocean, including humans, um, let alone other organisms in the food chain. Okay, uh, next up, winds carry and transfer heat around the earth. What happens if those wind patterns change? So if I change the wind patterns on the earth, right, then your weather will change, all right? If we change the weather in Kansas, okay, and we make it more dry because the weather changes, okay, or we make it more wet, more rainy, okay, you're going to have an issue because Kansas is where we do all of our farming, okay? In Georgia, if there are sudden droughts because the winds change, okay, um, if it becomes too blistering hot, our crops will die. Georgian farmers will lose their livelihoods. Um, if those wind patterns change, it can cause serious issues. Um, we mentioned the Hadley cells affected. Hadley cells are what create our biome. Hadley cells are whenever you have the equator here, okay, and you have lots of sunlight. It means a lot of evaporation. That means a lot of warm, moist air going up, creating clouds, and creating lots of rain. That creates your rainforest, okay? And then it moves this direction, the air does, and it rains more and more until it becomes cool and dry at the edges and descends to form deserts, which, again, are really cold at night because it's cool air there. They're only warm in the day because the sun's out and heats up the sand. But at night, they're really cool because, again, it's cool, dry air that descends to form the deserts. But anyways, if you affect these Hadley cells with shifting winds, then a desert that was once here, maybe... It shortens up. Maybe it doesn't go quite so far before a desert is created. So organisms that live in that area, right, that used to be over here, there's no desert anymore, right? How are they going to survive now if they don't have the certain desert conditions that they require? Um, and it, organisms that lived here in the grassland, now they're dealing with the desert. How are they going to survive? So how these cells being affected can affect a lot about the biomes themselves and where the animals live, or uh, plants as well, I should say. Okay, next. Uh, jet stream affected. So we mentioned the jet stream before. The jet stream is what caused, it's this beautiful, where are you, cold stream going across around the Arctic zone here, okay? And if we have America, it's America-ish, and there's Mexico down there. There's a little state called Texas. That's my best Texas. Cut me some slack. Anyways, the jet stream, if there's a little bump of warm air up, can actually bow this jet stream, okay? And so where normally it would go up there through Canada, where it's why Canada is so cold, it can get dipped down here to Texas. And that's when the Lone Star State gets destroyed by all that cold air. So jet stream being affected, changing wind patterns can cause not only heat in certain places that don't deserve heat, but also cold in places that don't need cold. And it can kill humans as well as animals. What is the ocean conveyor belt? That's the heat transfer in the ocean. So we always talk about this, the fact that hot things rise, hot things go up. So if you have a globe, right, and you have an equator, okay, if you have a lot of heat at the equator, well, eventually that heat's going to travel up, and I suppose also down. It's going to go from hot to cold, okay? And so this movement of heat up, okay, or heat down, depending upon which hemisphere you're in, okay, northern or north or south, all right, is going to create natural currents, okay, and so the great ocean conveyor belt goes over the whole earth, 
carrying warm water, okay? And if I can, what's happening to it is it's being stopped, okay? This movement of water around the whole earth is stopping, okay, because of climate change. When you have, um, for example, the Gulf Stream we've mentioned many times. So you have the U.S., you have Mexico, and you have Great Britain over here, and of course Europe. All right, normally there's the Gulf Stream, which carries warm, right, water all the way over to Great Britain. And that's what keeps Great Britain nice and warm, even though it should be really cold. Um, the problem is, the more the Earth heats up, the more you have all of this ice up here, all right, that starts to melt. And when it does, cold, um, salt-free water, cold, fresh water can actually interrupt this right here. And so you have no more warm water going to Great Britain. And if that happens, then Great Britain is going to get cold. The creatures there will die. The people who live there will have to adapt. Um, it just would be a nightmare if this conveyor belt stopped. Another thing to think about is the fact that not only does the conveyor belt take heat around the Earth um, from the equator to the poles, it also helps cycle nutrients. If I can do my best ocean here. So here's the ocean floor. Typically, you have cold water down here, okay? And the cold water has lots of nutrients because everything up here that dies falls to the bottom. So all the good cold nutrient water, nutrient rich water is down here in the cold. But the movement of water over the surface, right? All these currents, the wind currents, all right, the ocean currents will actually cause this nutrient rich water to be pulled up, okay? As this water moves this direction, it pulls water up from below. And it creates, the, it gives a chance for these nutrients to come up to the surface. All right, if this conveyor belt stops, if that movement of water stops, then nothing will pull up that cold nutrient rich water. And so the creatures up here at the top will have fewer nutrients. So that's another issue with the conveyor belt. Okay. Um, I think we talked about the nutrients. Why is Seattle so foggy and warm? Again, same reason. There's warm, um, there's warm water there coming up from the equator along the coast of California which meets the cold air from above from Canada and makes Seattle so foggy and warm. If the conveyor belt stops, Seattle will also become uh, cold, just like the rest of Canada, um, and it will become less hospitable to the people who live there. Why are the polar regions melting and responding so much more quickly to global warming than other parts of the world? Albedo. What is albedo? Albedo is the tendency of ice being white to reflect sunlight. So sunlight comes in at an indirect angle and deflects off into space, which is great. However, the more the ice melts, the more the sun is absorbed by the water. Okay, the dark water here. And that's the key, is it's dark. So the ice gets smaller and smaller and smaller, all right, which means more and more light is absorbed by the water. The more light is absorbed by the water, the more the ice melts. The more the ice melts, the more the light is absorbed by the water. And it creates a positive feedback loop, right? With more ice melt, all right, will contribute to higher temperatures, okay? Because the water starts to heat up. So that goes up in terms of heat, okay? So again, the more the ice melts, the more the water increases in temperature. The more the water increases in temperature, the more the ice will melt, and it just goes back and forth, back and forth until all the ice is gone. And that's our issue. When the polar ice melts, it can release what things into the air that contribute to more global warming, specifically methane, okay? All the methane trapped in all that ice, okay? Uh, produced by organisms way back in the day and rotting vegetation. All that methane is trapped in there will be released into the atmosphere and that's not great for global warming, so make it happen more. What happens to polar bears when the ice runs out? We talked about that. They can't hunt seals anymore. What happens to plants in the soil when the temperature gets too high? Well, just like animals, plants can be stressed, right? If it's too cold or if it's too hot. Specifically, if we look at a plant, um, that's a plant or something, right? They have a nice root system here, okay? That's at normal temperature. However, if it's too cold, they don't have very many roots. If it's too hot, you have the same issue here with too few roots. So it can affect the amount of root growth, which can affect the actual organism itself. And so if it's too hot, it's stressed, it's smaller or it dies. If it's too cold, again, it's smaller or it dies. Those are the issue with having, that's the issue with uh, affecting the temperature of the soil. So um, next up, how can, hey man, go ahead. How can rainfall be affected by climate change? And what does this mean for soil and farmers in different areas around the world? If you heat up the earth, okay, you're gonna cause more evaporation. 
More evaporation is going to cause more precipitation, right? The more precipitation you have, the more flooding you're going to have. And if there's a ton of flooding in an area, you're going to get lots of erosion. Once you, once you erode all that lovely um, a topsoil, right, you can't grow any more plants. That's going to be a problem, right? Erosion can be a serious issue for farmers. You'd think that more water would be good. Well, not in this case. Not if it's going to cause more erosion, okay, of your, of your delicious topsoil. Um, you can also have an issue where there's a drought, right? And if there's a drought, well, you can't grow plants. They don't have enough water. Okay, so it's going to be an issue either with flooding, um, can remove nutrients from the soil. You can have droughts where you can't grow enough plants. Um, so all of that's going to be bad for farmers in different areas of the world. How will ocean warming affect O2 levels in the ocean? We mentioned this before. O2 levels in the ocean, if it warms, will go down because solubility goes down. How will lower levels of O2 affect the aquatic metabolism? Well, respiration requires oxygen. So if you have less oxygen... You'll have less. I don't know why I'm drawing it over. You'll have less respiration. Okay, less oxygen, less respiration. How will ocean warming affect the reproduction of certain organisms? We mentioned turtles, right? Their gender is often determined by the temperature in the area. So if you have, I think if it's too hot, it will make females. Okay, actually, I'm gonna try this. Isn't this a thing? The symbols. Maybe. Anyways, and if it's too cold, it will be a male. I think this is what my sister said, but I'm not totally sure. Um, yes, so that can affect turtles. If you have a whole population full of females, you're not going to have a whole lot of reproduction going on. How will ocean warming cause coral bleaching? Again, just like plants, coral can be stressed. If it's too hot, the animal inside, remember they're a plant and an animal in symbiosis. Okay, an algae, I should say, not a plant. But that zooxanthellae, which was what's called the algae, will be expelled from the animal if it's too hot. It's like, I don't want to take care of all these things inside me. Get them out. And when it does, you got to realize that the algae is a big part of its actual um, uh, food source and food supply. So if the coral, the animal, kicks out the algae, you're going to have an issue because it's not getting enough food anymore. I'm sorry. I've been talking for a while and my brain's starting to come. Okay. So coral bleaching caused by stresses. It can be through ocean acidification. Uh, it can also be through ocean warming. All right. Uh, and it causes coral bleaching. When the algae is kicked out, the algae give the color because they do photosynthesis. Um, can, coral excuse me, can coral reefs recover after bleaching? <sighs> yes, the answer is they can. Of course they can. But they can only recover so much. So if the coral bleaches too much, like if we have this whole area of coral, of coral okay, and this much, oh my goodness gracious, this much gets bleached. Well, the hope is that the next season it can come back. But if this much gets bleached, okay, then the next season maybe only, you know, maybe only this much comes back. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller every year as too much is actually bleached for it to be able to recover properly. Okay, so that's the concern. Not that they can't recover, just they can't recover fast enough to deal with the amount of bleaching. Okay, ocean acidification. Why are CO2 levels in the ocean increasing? Well, because we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere. CO2 in the atmosphere will soon become CO2 in the ocean. And when it's dissolved in the ocean, water plus CO2 gives you carbonic acid. Carbonic acid can split up into acid, the high H plus, we call it, it's basically the acid, the proton, okay, and then bicarbonate, which is H, good grief, HCO3 negative, because that's plus, that's negative. Okay, anyways, um, this is what happens, and this gets into our water, into our oceans, increasing acidification. Um, make sure you're able to come up with that equation on your own. Um, show the equation for acidification. Again, CO2 plus H2O gives you um, carbonic acid. That can be split up into bicarbonate and um, H+. Next, um, what ways do we contribute to increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere? Well, fossil fuel burning, yes. Deforestation, of course. Trees can't pull out the CO2 from the atmosphere anymore. And also, decomposing trees. When you decompose the tree... Bacteria do respiration, they release CO2. So it's actually the decomposition of the tree as well that causes um, the CO2 to go up. Not just the fact that we're cutting down trees. They can't breathe in the CO2 anymore. It's because they're releasing CO2 as they die. 
Um, how does ocean acidification cause coral bleaching? The same way. It's stressing the animal out. It expels the zooxanthellae, expels the algae, and causes the bleaching. Next, can invasive species be good for an area? I mean, yeah. I mean, any species you bring in could possibly be of benefit for the area. Okay, the problem is that they're not always. Okay, so they can be good for an area, but only until they threaten invasive species. This is kind of why we call them invasive. So there's lots of foreign species brought into an area, but they're not always a bad thing unless they're affecting the native species there. Most native species are generalists, okay? When we call them that, it's because they're eating up everything, right? We call them invasive when they threaten native species. They eat too much of different things and they are selected. They basically produce a ton, a ton of offspring. Um, how can we control these things? Well, we can use three major controls. We mentioned before, you have the biological control, the chemical control, and the mechanical. Number one, bring in another invasive species. Bring in a predator, okay? A predator of that creature. And maybe the predator can take it out. But of course, maybe the predator can also be a problem. And now you got two invasive species in the area, and that's not great either. Pardon me. Next up, um, chemical. You can actually just put out a bunch of chemicals that kill that thing. I think we talked about an island with a whole bunch of rats and bunnies and cats on it. Um, so they had to get rid of the rats and the mice. So they laid out a bunch of rat poison Killed off all the rats, right? And then you can also try the mechanical method, which is just to physically go out there and grab them. I showed you the video of the uh, the lionfish. The guy was spearing, right? I showed you, um, they talked about the fact that dogs were sent out to train and to hunt the rabbits and pull them out of there. I talked about people in the outback in Australia going out, grabbing a whole bunch of these toads, putting them in a bag and suffocating them with CO2. Um, there's lots of mechanical ways you can do it as well. And the last thing I mentioned that's surprising, but eat them, right? Some of these things, some of these invasive species are things that you can eat. So uh, please think of doing so. What are some uh, famous invasive species and how are they spread? Okay, the main one I want you to know about is zebra mussels. Okay, the zebra mussels spread through, all right, the boats, all right, them not properly washing their boats off and them not properly flushing out their engines, okay? Or what's called their bilge, okay? Um, which is the water that kind of holds the, the boat floating. So the bilge water or the boat water or the sides of the boat can have like little spores. Um, I'm not sure why I can't think of the name for a baby mussel. But anyways, if it's some of it is in the water, that zebra mussel will take over that entire ecosystem. They're just wiping out um, North America pretty, pretty bad right now. Um, and so people have to be very careful to clean their boats properly before they send them into the water. Of course, we talk about cane toads. How are they spread? Well, they were spread by humans bringing them in as a biological control for the cane beetle. Okay, uh, so humans can spread them. We talked about lionfish. Lionfish were brought in because lionfish were really good at, um, or should be looked really good in an aquarium. But people would get tired of taking care of the organism. They didn't want to kill it, so they throw it in the ocean but it doesn't belong in the Atlantic Ocean. It's an Asian fish, so it's, it's supposed to be from um, the South China Sea, probably. Um, that's all I can think of over there. But yeah, maybe from the Pacific, okay? And so bring them to the Atlantic, they have no natural predators, and they're taking over. Um, I think we mentioned kudzu. So uh, kudzu was brought in because to stop erosion. Like, it's really nice. It gets on the side of uh, hills and stuff like that, and it can prevent erosion. Um, which can be great. The problem is it's invasive, and so it took over like, all the trees in the area. So the kudzu just climbs up, blocks all the light from the tree, and kills the tree almost as a parasite. Okay, but we brought it in for a reason. We brought it in to reduce erosion on our hillsides. Uh, it didn't work out for us too well, okay, because it took over. Um, you also had, I think, the black wattle in South Africa. I think it was brought in for its, uh, for its wood. But anyway, up taking over the whole area and depleting their already stressed out water sources. Okay, endangered species. In what way do we humans endanger species? Well, pretty straightforward. Hunting, aka poaching. Limiting their diet by habitat fragmentation, which we talked about earlier. Bringing in invasive species that compete with them. Competition is a negative negative. It's bad for both. So we're going to invasive species that can wipe out native species. Um, destroying their endemic habitats, so all that deforestation, okay, making room for our cities and our roads uh, and our buildings. 
Will all endangered species go extinct? The answer is no. Okay? Some will evolve. That's a possibility. Oh, why can't I spell evolve? Some will evolve and they can change and they can. That's not evolve. Evolve. No. I'm sorry, guys. There's something, I'm serious. There's something physically wrong with me, but uh, spring break will cure it, right? Evolve. There we go. Okay, how? Uh, naturally? I mean, yeah, they might naturally recover. Uh, we might have to go out and actually protect them. That's the key, is if we can provide protection, we can provide sanctuaries, areas where um, uh, people are not allowed to hunt, and um, we can conserve or preserve those species, like we did with the bison. Returning them from, again, they were over, if I can find the numbers here, there we go. Oh, Lord. Stop. Oh, what did you do? There were over 60... Oh, my goodness gracious. Someone probably... I think there's like probably three of you watching this right now. Don't laugh. Okay? I'm trying. Okay, so there were something like 60 million bison. We started wiping them out for food and for fun. And they got the number down all the way to 541. That's not a lot compared to 60 million. So eventually, we protected the areas. We brought that number back up to somewhere around 300,000 by now. Okay? Which is good. All right? We're, we're bringing them back. But again, we had to protect their areas and their land and their habitat in order to do so. What's a selective pressure? Well, natural selection, artificial selection. Selection just means selected for death. Okay, so if you're selected, you're going to be killed. A selective pressure is a pressure that will kill you, okay, if given long enough. Such as maybe, let's say, increasing the temperature of the earth, okay, and then that would decrease the amount of O2. That's a selective pressure on the fish in the ocean. Um, especially large fish like whales and killer whales, um, they're going to need lots of oxygen being so large. And so they uh, will have serious issues surviving in really hot water. Um, how can they affect a species? By stressing it. That's the main point. They affect a species by stressing it. If species are crowded together by our choices, it increases competition. Competition is bad for all species. We mentioned that. We talked about relationships, mutualism, plus plus, commensalism, plus zero, co-mensalism, because of the O in there. One gets something, one gets nothing. You have parasitism, good for one, bad for the other. And lastly, you have competition, bad for both. Animals try to avoid it at all possible. Name some animals that are endangered and threatened and what might be causing that endangerment. Polar bears, endangered, melting sea ice. Uh, we mentioned koalas, okay, in Australia. Habitat fragmentation, right? We're building developments, we're cutting through their forests, with deforestation. Um, let me see, what are some other animals that are endangered and threatened? You have elephants and rhinoceri, rhinoceroses? I think that's right. Uh, anyways, poachers, you know, just uh, killing them left and right um, for their ivory or for their, um, or for their horns. Um, there are many others, and I don't know why I'm blanking on them, but again, the main ideas are, what are we doing? I think that was up here. Excessive hunting, limiting of their diet, bringing in invasive species, and destroying their habitat. Okay. Uh, what can we do to protect animal populations? Well, criminalize poaching, protect animal habitats, and legalize um, legalization prohibiting hunting. Oh, wow. Again, my brain. I'm so sorry. Drop, a, drop an F in the chat for me there. Um, legislation. <laughs> Uh, laws prohibiting hunting or land development in certain areas, okay? So not completely um, limiting some of these things, although we can prohibit hunting of these creatures. That is allowed, okay? But we can also limit it. We do that around here in Georgia. You're only allowed to get so many bucks or so many does uh, per hunting season, okay? Uh, so we can limit the amount of hunting that goes on as well as prohibiting it entirely. Uh, or stop people from developing land in certain areas. You're not allowed to mine in certain areas. You're not allowed to uh, uh, dig for oil, drill for oil in certain areas. <sighs> what legislation exists that can help protect endangered species? You have CITES, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. You're going to want to know that acronym because it will explain what CITES is. When you see it on a little choice question, you want to know what that stands for. So go ahead and memorize that now. Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. We don't want people trading ivory. We don't want them trading um, uh, rhino horn. We don't want any of this stuff being traded because that creates a demand. Demand requires supply. So people will go out and poach these things and hunt them 
and we have to protect our wild fauna, fauna being the animals and flora being the plants. Okay, um, so that's limiting the trade of these things. The Endangered Species Act itself can list things as endangered and can mean that we can uh, eliminate them from being hunted. We can protect their habitats, okay? Um, so we're finding ways to support them if they are endangered. You're not allowed to build in areas where they're nesting, okay? You're not allowed to um, remove resources from their area that they need, okay? We're finding ways to protect endangered species and making it uh, against the law to endanger them further and risk extinction. Last section, oh gosh. Coming through this so fast. All right, human impacts on biodiversity. Number one, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity implies both species richness and species evenness. Having a lot of different species and having them be about the similar amounts, okay? And if you have um, a lot of species and you have a lot of those members of those species, it can help an, or, uh, a, an ecosystem survive a bottlenecking event. So let's say that um, a giant asteroid hits the Earth. If we have many different species on the Earth who all have different roles and different jobs, even though some of them will die from the asteroid hitting, others will survive and be able to continue on um, with life. Okay, that's called a bottlenecking event, like a giant volcano exploding, um, like the super volcano over at Yellowstone, okay, um, or an asteroid hitting, like we mentioned with the dinosaurs. Um, how does it affect biodiversity? So, um, bottlenecking events can occur lots, can occur lots of ways. Naturally, yes, through volcanoes, asteroids, etc., tsunamis. But it can also happen uh, by humans. We do simple bottlenecking events every time we build a house, a new subdivision. Okay, we cut down all the forests over there. Okay, the animals that live there now have less area to live in, and because they have less area to live in, um, they're put under stress, and that stress can cause selective pressure. That selective pressure means some of them will die, and that's a bottlenecking event. How does it affect biodiversity? Well, if you stress organisms out, they can die. If they die, there's less diversity available, okay? And so that means that the whole environment's now at more risk, um, and that can be really bad. Um, of, again, so um, leading to possible extinctions. I'm so sorry. I promise I'm better than this. What is HIPCO and how is it related to biodiversity? So my memory is not really doing too good right now. I'm, I believe in myself though. Um, what do humans do that can affect biodiversity? H stands for habitat destruction. I believe that's right. I is invasive species. P, pollution. Second P, Uh, C, uh, I'll look it up, hold on, give me a second. The C stands for climate change, and O stands for over-exploitation. Why do I remember that, not the P? All right, so habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, I got nothing. Pollution, I remember I was talking about it. Uh, yeah, and then climate change and over-exploitation. But anyways, this will come up at some point, and I'll go through exactly what that is. Now, um, what is habitat fragmentation? Habitat fragmentation is when we are basically taking a wide range of habitats, okay, with lots of trees and stuff, and we are cutting through it. We're dividing it into chunks because we're building beautiful houses in different places, little roads, uh, and this causes different areas of habitat. So now this one huge rectangle, right, of flora and fauna is now broken up into one, two, three different fragments. And the problem is species can't always get from one area to the other, and that can reduce uh, and make their gene pool smaller. Um, so by reducing the gene pool, you're going to cause a lot of inbreeding, which can cause um, a lot of um, bad negative effects for those creatures. Where is it? Oh, over here, sorry. Habitat destruction and invasive food. Population? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Oh, I knew it was population. I knew it. I should have just guessed it. You should have just said it, Ellis. You should have just said it. Okay. I think the focus is on human population. Our human population means we need lots of resources. Okay? We need lots of places to stay, and um, that can cause issues with local species as well. Okay. What is the edge effect? So the edge effect I mentioned before is 
the more edge there is, right, the more exposure there is for the organism, okay? And by exposure, I mean exposure to selective pressures. So if we take a look at this environment here, it's a nice little circle, all right? It has an edge here, that's true. But even though, let's say, let's make it like this. Okay, even though this and this both have the same area, say, oh my gosh, so the area equals x, area equals x, okay? The circumference is different, y, and then circumference equals 2y. I promise, I promise I'm going to throw this thing in the trash can. So there's twice as much circumference here as there is here, all right? Circumference is the distance around the outside of the circle. Therefore, there is more edge here, okay? Now, more edge just means more exposure for the organisms that are there, exposure to possible harm, and animals don't like living along the edge. They prefer to live in the center, well away from any selective pressures. So the more edge you have, the uh, more stressed the populations will be, the more issues they will have. What can we do to stop habitat fragmentation? Well, we can, of course, protect certain areas, limit housing developments from being made okay in certain areas but assuming we have roads and things like that that are going on we can do little things like building these um oh, of course i'm gonna blank on the name i'm just gonna pull it up oh i'm not doing it. i'm not I'm not doing great ellis you'll get there here we go that's the name a wildlife corridor so you see these wildlife corridors basically ba allowing the animals to move across from one area to the next um, so that they can um, join. Again, there is a certain gene pool over here. There is another gene pool over here, okay? And if the, there you go. All right, so if the two get separated, okay, they are going to inbreed, all right? Because if, if this doesn't exist, right, then the creatures over here will only breed together, the creatures over here will only breed together, and that limits your genetic diversity, which can cause inbreeding and can cause lots of uh, genetic issues and eventually lead to two new species. So it's better to leave this open and allow there to be just one species that exists over here. I don't know why. Okay, there we go. And then they can breed and stuff together. Oh my gosh, this is going great. All right, um, <laughs> please just stop being weird. Does the size of the protected area matter? The answer is yes. You'll always be better off with a large area compared to a small area. You'll, al you'll always be better off with a um, less edge versus more edge. So you always want there to be less edge, okay, and more area. Both of those are the best for protecting organisms. How will habitat fragmentation affect all species? Will habitat fragmentation affect all species equally or some more than others? It will always affect some more than others. Some species will always be better at surviving than others and just have some natural advantages others will not. Okay, so definitely not all species the same, but it can affect all species, just some more than others. How does speciation and gene flow play a role when habitat is fragmented? Like I said, if you fragment the habitat, the gene flow is cut off and those organisms breed together and will turn into new species through their geographic isolation. Can global climate change cause fragmentation? How? We mentioned rising sea levels, right? Um, droughts, killing off plants in a certain area. All those things can happen. Um, the melting of the sea ice in certain places, okay? Um, dividing up um, polar bear habitat, habitat. How can domestication result in a negative impact on biodiversity of a species? Well, if you domesticate cattle, you're only going to want the best cattle, so you're going to pick always the best bull and you're gonna reproduce that bull over and over and over again and continually use his genes, meaning all the calves are born with those same genes, meaning all the future calves will be inbred because they'll breed with other calves with similar genes. So we have an issue here with domestication because um, I think a good example here would be the, the Georgia Bulldog. I don't know how many Georgia Bulldog fans we have, but it became a huge issue when I was at school in my Six years, yeah, my six years of college at UGA, my bachelor's and master's, um, we had something like I don't know, 15 different Uggas. Ugga is the name of the dog mascot for UGA. And they were dying, like multiple <laughs> new Uggas were dying per year. 
um, and we just kept on going through them because they were so inbred. We were only allowed to breed our Ugga, the Georgia Bulldog, with other Georgia Bulldogs. And because it was such a small population, there was a lot of inbreeding and the things they couldn't breed. Like Bulldogs are already inbred badly enough and then we were making it even worse. So eventually they agreed to uh, reproduce our Georgia Bulldog with English Bulldogs to try and like add some genetic diversity in there. Um, again, diversity is always the key. And so uh, they've been lasting a little bit longer as of late. I haven't been keeping track of how many Uggas there are, but uh, it was bad for a while. Uh, but again, domestication can result in that because of the inbreeding situation. How can we limit our impact on biodiversity? Well, let's take a look at this. This is the big one. You're gonna to wanna to memorize these. Habitat corridors, always important. Promoting sustainable land use practices. In other words, instead of always cutting down a, a whole forest at once, okay, let's cut it down piecemeal in sections. We'll cut here, then we'll cut here, then we'll cut here, and then we'll cut here. And by the time we get to number four, number one has regrown. It's had time to regrow. This is sustainable, something we can continue on doing um, without affecting more of the environment, all right? After you cut home this whole place, you have to move to this whole place, and then this place isn't the time to regrow. It just becomes an issue. We're taking too much. All right, only take what we need and um, make sure it has time to replenish. Restoring lost habitats, that's something we can do as well. Okay, so um, replanting trees, all right, in certain areas that used to have them um, can be a big benefit to those areas because if the habitat is fragmented, okay, and you replant these areas with trees, okay, you can return this whole ecosystem back to its initial shape, okay, but it will require restoring those lost habitats. How can we limit our impact on biodiversity? Stop making so many humans, okay? I did my job, sort of, all right? I had two kids, all right? One for me, one for my wife, okay? Um, and so we're not adding anything to the overall global population. Something to consider um, when you're having children. Of course, it's always your choice, but something to consider. Um, stop urbanizing, building these cities and expanding. We call it suburban sprawl or urban sprawl. Right, the way cities just expand and take over the land, and then creating farmland. Let's maximize the farmland that we have before we go adding on to new ones, okay? Because as we have to deforest to do that, and it's affecting the Amazon and our biodiversity and bottlenecking our populations and putting them at risk uh, because of selective pressures uh, of, for extinction, and yeah. Oh, better yet, my, my community thumbs up. I don't know if some people will get that. Anyways, uh, good luck. If you have questions, which I'm sure you do because I talk really fast, please feel free to email me or call me or whatever, and uh, I'll try to answer them for you, okay? All right. Uh, peace out. Love you guys. If you need anything, like I said, reach out. All right. I am so done. I am so ready to be done.